Hello. This section covers the mass casualty incident uh, module one for the responder level based on the West Virginia Office of EMS's requirements for continued recertification. As usual, I'm going to allow you the chance to read the course objectives on your own. Please feel free to pause the video as needed. So a mass casualty incident, when, when we understand how West Virginia's geographic locations, our population centers, uh, transportation routes, any unique hazards, there's an enormous potential for incidents to occur which could injure a number of people and that could overwhelm any EMS system, whether it's West Virginia or New York City. So remember that just because we are West Virginia does not mean that a mass casualty incident cannot occur. Layperson is more likely to refer to a mass casualty incident as a disaster. Uh, so disaster has a specific legal meaning. The states and localities will declare a state of emergency and the president is responsible for declaring a major disaster. The types of disasters can range from anything involving natural disasters, um, earthquakes, hurricanes, so forth. It can be civil disobedience, it could be a criminal or a terrorist type act, and it can even involve transportation crashes. So we're looking at rail cars or even something on the, the roadways or highways, where it could involve some sort of technical hazards. But a mass casualty incident is defined as any incident that injures enough people to overwhelm the resources usually available in a particular system or area. And I think that's really important to understand. It could be that something as simple as three patients that have been injured, four patients that have been injured, could overwhelm an entire system. If Raleigh County or let's say Mercer County, if one of the counties goes out completely. All the trucks are out and no one is available. You only have one BLS truck that's available in the entire county, which has happened. Then there's this mass collision on the interstate. It could very well be a mass casualty incident because the resources that are normally there are not available at the time and it's going to overwhelm the system and tax the system out. So even something as simple as four patients could be a mass casualty incident. Now the goals for mass casualty incident management is to do the greatest good for the greatest number. And sometimes that's outside of our normal thought processes. Because when we come to a patient, we want to work with that patient. We, have, we are a very tactile um, type of uh, field career that we have. And when we get with that one patient, we want to do everything we can for them. But in a mass casualty incident, the rules have changed. And now we have to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And sometimes we, we want to utilize resources and exhaust our resources to help one person when in fact we need to make those resources stretch over a greater number of individuals. So it can be very mentally taxing and emotionally taxing on an individual. But we also need to be able to manage those scarce resources. And another big thing with MCI is we do not want to relocate the disaster. It's very easy if we're not paying attention, we're not utilizing MCI management properly to turn around and take that accident scene and suddenly migrate them and shift them directly to the hospital. And now they're in the hospital's parking lot. All we did was pick up that disaster and move it to a new location. So we want to make sure that when we deal with the patients that are coming out of the, the incident, we are dispersing them so that we don't overwhelm a system in a different area. So again, we're talking about the greatest good. Heroic resuscitative efforts in this situation are not appropriate. It takes too much time. It requires too much equipment for those that we could use on salvageable patients. And the staffing for that is very intensive. So we want to concentrate on salvageable patients. And as I mentioned, this can be very counterintuitive to what we know as our job on a day-to-day -day basis. But when we look at resource demands, we want to consider a lot of things. One, what types of equipment do we need? 
What type of responding personnel do we have to have coming to this incident? What kind of facilities do we have or do we need in order to move them? So we're talking about equipment, you know, what equipment do we need to provide basic care? Do we need to look at the fact, maybe uh, if you're looking at this picture, it looks like it's really wet outside. Do we need to provide uh, some sort of uh, maybe dry clothing, you know, is that a type of resource that we need to consider? Uh, facilities, we need to find some place that's dry for these people to move to. We don't want them in the elements. We don't know how cold it is. Of course, they're wearing t-shirts, so it can't be too terribly bad. But those are some things to bring into your mindset when you're dealing with a mass casualty situation. And again, we don't want to relocate the disaster. We want to make sure that we take those patients we prioritize them at the scene and then we distribute them to various hospitals so we don't tax out a different area or a different system altogether. We don't want them all going to the same place. So EMS has a very specific component of overall incident management system. So we're going to look at our initial response roles and responsibilities. As the first arriving unit, we need to begin with this, the five S's. The first S stands for safety assessment. So we're going to assess the scene for safety. If you look at this particular picture, obviously the scene is not safe. It is not contained and we need to look at getting the correct resources in and available in order to uh, contain or control the scene so that we can start providing care. S2 is scene size up. So how bad is the incident? How big is it? So what type of incident are we involved in? Involved in? Uh, the approximate number of patients. What do the severity of injuries look like? And how is the area? what is the area that is involved? And that includes access. It's really important to send that information back to the 911 center or the emergency operations center so that they know how to bring or direct the units into the scene so that we don't create a bottleneck or a means that kind of ruins our access and egress methods. And then S3 is how to send information. So we want to give a report on the situation and then request additional assistance as needed. And then we want to make sure that they are in, in contact with, with the hospital for notification purposes there. S4 is set up. So once you've done all of this, now you're at the point where you need to create staging. You want to secure that access and egress. I mentioned that before. So we want to make sure that we have a means for those units to come in, but then we also want to have a clear method for those crews to be able to e egress out. And we want to secure adequate space for the purpose of triage, treatment, and transportation. S5 involves the start triage system. And remember that triage is the French word for to sort. So we're, ass we're assuring that rapid initial assessment of all patients is taking place and that way we can assign what type of treatment that is needed. So the purpose of triage is to sign, assign priorities. We're going to separate the victims into easily identifiable groups. We're going to use four colors for that purpose. We have red, yellow, green, and black. And the easiest way to reduce part of your load is to, when you first arrive at this point in your five S's, to get over your loudspeaker on your um, EMS unit and scream out, you know, to those that can hear me and can, you know, everybody stand up. If you can move, I need you to go to stand underneath the willow tree, for example. I don't know, come up with you know whatever is closest uh, for you. But that way you're physically taking all of those green patients that are able to walk and you're migrating them to an area where you can sit them down. You've just taken away a quarter of your job, maybe more, depending on the, the type of incident. So this is a good way to get a good start on that then all you're left with is the reds, the yellows, and the blacks. So let's go ahead and look at the purpose of triage and how this works. Again, in the long run, when we are, when we are performing triage, we are attempting 
to try to decide what resources are necessary and how we want to distribute those patients based on their priority. So we're looking at treatment, transportation, and definitive care, required resources. Now the benefit to triage, we're able to identify patients who need the, that medical care rapidly in order to save life or limb. It provides rational distribution of casualties and it also reduces the burden on each hospital. Average about 10 to 15 percent of mass casualty incidents require extended hospitalization. So that kind of gives you a better idea of what you're doing with that initial triage. Now there are problems with the triage systems. Some rely on specific injuries and physical findings in order to categorize and prioritize patients uh, and it is understanding that in-depth assessments will actually require too much time and that's not what we're there for. So the ideal triage system is considered simple, there's no advanced assessment skills necessary, and we're not pro providing a diagnosis at this time. The best person to have as your triage people are the ones that, are, that have the least amount of training. Um, you, you can have your paramedics do it if that's the, the, what you have in front of you, your availability on your resources, but your best options are to use those lower trained individuals. So if you're working with uh, interagency groups, you have more than one agency that's responded to the incident, they have a bunch of um, emergency vehicle operators, those individuals and your EMTs are the ones that are the best to do this triage system because they're not going to focus on trying to create specific diagnoses like a paramedic would and there there's no need for the advanced assessment skills so they're going to be able to make that quick rapid decision and be able to move on to that next person. So it's very easy to perform, provides rapid and very simple life-saving interventions. It's very easy to teach and to learn, and let's look at those now. So typically the state has provided us with a uh, triage ribbon system. Uh, it's kind of like surveyor tape that's used in order to make ribbons, and they're universal colors, so we're talking about something that's very simplistic. Uh, one of the best things that was ever told to me, and I like it, is if you're responsible for going out and triaging patients, it's very easy to go out and wrap a ribbon around someone's uh, wrist or around their neck, and then you walk back to the truck and you're trying to give that report to that incident commander, and you're like, well, I had, oh, I think there were five reds and maybe seven or eight yellows, your mind is not going to allow you to memorize those numbers. But what you can do is when you wrap that red ribbon around the neck of the patient, you can tear off just a little piece of that ribbon and put it in your EMS pocket and then move to the next patient. Oh, we're going to assign them a yellow. We're going to put that yellow tag around their neck. We're going to pull a little bit of the yellow ribbon. We're going to put it in our pocket. That way, when you actually go back to the incident commander and you're trying to provide him with more detailed uh, report on your triage results, you'll be able to pull those ribbons out of your pocket and you'll be able to count those out and know exactly what you've done. So let's talk about the red patients. Those are considered the immediate, they have the highest priority, they typically will have a problem with, some, with a respiratory issue or airway maintenance, they're not perfusing well so they don't have a pulse, or they may have an alteration in the mental status or maybe it's a, a good example would be severe burns that have co air, airway compromise, and we know that you know if they can't maintain an airway, they're gonna they're going to rapidly um, descend through the system. So we want to make sure that they're listed as an immediate. A patient is determined to receive a yellow ribbon if they're considered a secondary priority or a delayed response. In other words, these are injuries or illnesses that are not going to create a life or death situation. They're not as critical as the red patient. So this could be someone who has suffered burns maybe on their um, their arm or something but it doesn't involve airway or maybe they have multiple joint uh, they have multiple bone or joint injuries that could be causing uh, pain issues, back or spine injuries. 
And finally, we, we come back to that group of green. This is our walking wounded, if you will. These are the minor, minor injuries, the minor wounded. They may have painful or swollen deformities or minor soft tissue injuries. So again, these are the walking the wounded, the ones that can get up and physically move away from the incident. You know, you get them out of your way to where you can focus on the problems that you really have at hand. And then the final category is our black category, and these are the patients that are considered dead or non-salvageable. They're a low priority. Non-salvageable in this category is very intimidating, and coming from someone who's been in this situation on numerous occasions for mass casualty incident, it's very difficult to walk away from that situation where you have a patient that you know you could probably save if you had the resources available to do so. Unfortunately, we're in that situation with a mass casualty incident. Again, the rules have changed, and we can't always help them. A good example, um, my husband was responsible for uh, oversight of, I think it was down in Katrina. Um, it wasn't the Superdome, it was the Cajun Dome. He was uh, one of the supervisors managing the Cajun Dome during Katrina, the hurricane. So he had a group of elderly patients that required medications in order to sustain them uh, with their medical conditions that they had. There were no medications to be had. Patients were being transported 50, 100 miles away. You know, Katrina was so expansive. So those resources weren't readily available. Those patients were, were tag black. They were non-salvageable because they didn't have the medications needed to maintain them. As hard as that was for them to do, um, when the resources finally came available, of those four individuals, I think it was four individuals he had, three of those had already passed away. So understand that non-salvageable can be a very difficult category to talk about. It's a very difficult, difficult category for people to deal with. But non-breathing patients, resuscitation would normally be attempted, but because we're in a mass casualty, it's considered not salvageable, uh, so we don't want to waste our time with that. In other words, if you can't manage it with a simple airway jaw thrust and that correct the situation, um, then you can't stay with that patient. Your goal with triage is to keep moving. So when it comes to initiating triage, if you're not familiar with it, if you've never done it before, it can be a very intimidating process. But the big thing to remember is to start the triage system exactly where you stand, look around the room, get a global picture. The worst thing you want to do is walk into a situation with your blinders on. You need to have a good, clear idea of what you're dealing with. So identify those who are injured that can also walk. Tell them to get up and physically move them out of the way. Put them someplace where all that green, all those green patients can sit and uh, can be easily identified and recognized. And that puts them in an area, you make sure that the area is away from the immediate danger outside the initial triage area. And again, that's green tape. And then we want to make sure that we move physically through that particular situation or that, that event in a very systematic and orderly pattern. So you want to make sure that you assess each casualty you come to and mark the category using the triage tags. I know in the picture it shows placing it on their arm, but if you have a situation where you may have arms missing off of patients, then you have to ask yourself, well, where would they have triaged and put that tag? So the easiest way to do that is to tie the ribbon around their neck. We're not talking tighten it into like a choker. We're just talking about hanging it around their neck like a necklace would. And then, you know, you you want to maintain your count. So it has on here where you can actually take a piece, piece of two inch tape, put it on your leg and you mark it as you come to each person. But like I had said before, if you actually pull a piece of that ribbon off and stick it in your pocket, that's just as effective. So it's either way you want to do that. But the biggest thing to remember when you're triaging patients is you're providing very minimal treatment. You're either going to one, manually open the airway or two, 
apply some sort of bandaging or dressing or something to stop any gross uh, extreme amounts of bleeding. So those are the only two interventions you're doing. The goal is to keep moving. Don't ever stop. So once you've moved the green patients to an area that's already been supervised uh, or you have someone assigned to that can supervise them or tell them to wait there and we'll get someone to come help them, that has them out of your way. So when you're looking at your other patients, you want to start asking yourself some very specific, specific questions. One, do they have respirations? If the answer is yes, then we have to decide is it greater than or less than 30 because that's going to make you decide whether it's a red patient or you need to move on to the next category. So the very first step we're doing with triage is respirations. Is the respiratory rate greater or less than 30? If they're not breathing, then we're going to attempt to open the airway with manual uh, head tilt uh, chin lift if possible or just re readjusting. If they're still not breathing, at that point they're tagged black. If they begin breathing, then we know that their airway is very precarious, very positional, and they would be tagged red. So if you have those patients that their respiratory rate is less than 30 and they're doing just fine, that's when you have to assess the radial pulse. If they have a radial pulse present, then we're going to move on again to that next level. So we've looked at respirations, now we're looking at perfusion. If the radial pulse is absent, that person is tagged a red patient and we want to stop any major bleeding that we find and if we have a patient who is in shock, we want to elevate the legs if we can without causing further damage. So we've looked at respirations, we've looked at uh, perfusion or the pulse, that radial pulse, and our next step is to go to the mental status. So if they can follow commands, if they've done, if they've cascaded through, the respiratory rate is less than 30, um, they have a pulse, and they can follow commands, but they have something that's, that's holding them from being considered a green patient, then that's when we're going to mark them as yellow. Otherwise, if they have an alteration in their mental status, they are marked as an immediate red. So this is what the start triage looks like if you had it in a cascade uh, presentation. So it's all about whether the patient is breathing, what their circulation or their perfusion level is, and their mental status. And if you have any issues with any of those three, they're going to be tagged as a red. If not, then they're going to be tagged as yellow. Or if they're not breathing at all, we're going to immediately stop at that point and consider them a black tag. Now the jump start is meant specifically for our pediatric patients. Uh, and it is set up very similar, but there are some particular changes so I want you to kind of notice if you can on this sheet or if you can pull up the sheet in the PDF file that you've been given you'll see that the respiratory rate instead of being greater or less than 30 with a pediatric patient we're looking at a rate between 15 to 40 or if it's irregular um, then that's how they categorize that and then you'll see with the mental status is it appropriate or inappropriate and then that's how they're going to they're, they're going to determine it that way so um, again if you have any questions um, please let us know uh, but take a few minutes look at this see what the differences are and when you move into a secondary triage this is when the triaging is done a, a second time and it's usually on a stretcher a stretcher excuse me, it's on a stretcher uh, either on the way to the treatment area or actually in the treatment area itself or it may be depending on the situation and depending on the scene you may not have a need for that secondary triage until you get in the back of the ambulance and you're on the way to the hospital but in the case of the secondary triage you're doing a more in-depth reassessment and you're going to base your decision for secondary triage on your clinical experience and judgment so that's the important part with that so with your, you're doing your start triage, your secondary triage, and then ongoing. This should be done continuously. You're wanting to maintain contact with those patients and ensure that you're maintaining those patients. 
So a West Virginia triage tag is white, it's weather resistant material, and it's meant to be used with a ballpoint pen. The nice part about the triage tags that West Virginia has is it does allow you to reassess that patient multiple times and you've got that continuous patient uh, information record that's kept and there's a continuous accountability and tracking system. It's a very easy to interface with the, the hospital with the patient records because they do have some peel and stick things that go with it um, with barcoding. So let me show you that next. So here's the patient information section. Uh, we know that when we're, we're doing the initial triage, we're not going to be able to probably collect this all at that time. However, it can be added throughout the entire event, and we can include that information as we go. In the triage status section, you can actually see how that patient was originally triaged, and then what happened in the secondary and the time that it took place and then also if there was some sort of change that made the reevaluation change the location they are in the triage tag. So maybe you had a patient that was originally tagged as a yellow, they went into secondary triage the first time they were assessed they thought yeah okay they're fine we'll keep them as a yellow and then maybe their condition worsened when they went back and reassessed on that part of that ongoing assessment and they were changed to a red patient. So that gives us plenty of opportunities to actually make those adjustments and track that patient's care. Then the chief complaint section, it tries to create a more uh, global approach, more obvious injuries or illnesses can be circled. It indicates injuries on the human figure itself and additional information can actually be added also on the comments section. And then in the transportation unit notes, uh, you can actually see the agency that was responsible for transporting the patient, what the destination hospital was supposed to be, and then the actual time that the patient arrived. So again, this is a good way for a very chaotic situation to be able to maintain um, some sort of documentation of what takes place with that patient throughout so that they're less likely to get lost in the system. And then this is that uh, peel and stick kind of label thing we were talking about earlier. A lot of times they can use that because the barcoding is identical. So it can actually go with the patient. It can be included with uh, maybe their personal items uh, can be tagged so that they know that if there's a bag of clothing or maybe a purse or something or a wallet, it can be tagged and go directly with that patient. They know who it belongs to and it can be used within the hospital. So there's a lot of things that this, this peel off label section can actually be helpful for. But treatments, uh, a lot of treatments that we do, if they have to provide something at the hospital, they can actually use that to kind of track and record what took place. And then the transportation records section, this is a detachable um, and it's, it documents a patient's transported to the hospital or other facility and it can be fixed to transportation tactical worksheets. So it's something that's meant for you to be able to use in the transportation sector uh, to help you identify what patients have gone where. So if, there if there's a tracking issue and they can't identify someone, then that tag is left behind where you can have that record showing where they have gone. And then on the back of the triage tag, you have space for vital signs, medical history, and then also your treatment. So when it comes down to triage, the biggest thing you need to remember is that you can keep it simple. It doesn't have to be complex. You're already in an overwhelming and very taxing situation and your emotions, your mental status, everything is going to be taxed to its absolute limit. But you can utilize the triage system and keep yourself focused and move systematically throughout the grounds and treat these people with ease because all you have to remember is respiratory rate for an adult greater or less than 30 whether you're going to tag them red or move on if you move on you're checking the pulse if the pulse the radio pulse is present then they move on into the the next assessment if the radial pulse is absent they're marked red if you get down to mental status which is the third and the mental status is altered then they're marked red if the mental status is okay, that's the patient that's marked yellow. But if you have any questions or any concerns, please let us know. Um, the biggest things that you need to remember 
is about preparation and pre-planning. If you get the opportunities to take part in mass casualty training accidents or uh, training exercises, you really need to do so because the best way to learn is through the practice and seeing what works and what doesn't each time. And here's the big key for you to remember as well. Always do the greatest good for the greatest number. The rules have changed with the mass casualty situation. It's not the same as dealing with a typical day-to-day -day transport. Do the greatest good for the greatest number, and that can be mentally and emotionally exhausting, but you've got to remember that that's what your goal is in a mass casualty situation. The rules are not the same. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. I have plenty of experience in mass casualty, and I'd be happy to work with you. Have a great day.